Um, first of all, welcome everybody. This is our first uh, Ask Me Anything session for Theta, and um, we're super excited to try this out with the topic of CLV. Uh, so I know a lot of you have sent questions in ahead of time, but we really want this to be a live conversation and a dialogue. So I um, would love for you to come off mute um, and ask your question, even if you submitted it ahead of time. And if for whatever reason you you can't uh, or don't want to be on a live mic um, today, you can also use the Q&A feature at the bottom of your screen. And Val and I are going to be keeping an eye on those while Pete and Dan continue to answer um, everybody's questions. Um, again, super casual format, a couple of little housekeeping things. Um, if you want to know why May 15th is our designated CLV day, we have a great blog on, on the topic and there's a QR code right here on the screen for you. The other thing I'm expecting to happen today is a lot of acronyms are going to be thrown around. <laughs> and if you visit our website, thetaclv.com, at the bottom footer, there's a link to a glossary. So it, it might be handy as you hear things being thrown around, uh, terms and such. So um, you can use that as you need to. Um, I'm buying a little bit of time, so <clears> I want somebody <throat> to be brave and get us started. But uh, Pete, Dan, you, know, you probably don't need any, any introduction these guys are well known in the area of customer value, customer lifetime value, customer based corporate valuation. Uh, Pete teaches at the Wharton School. Um, Dan is at Emory University, Goizetta Business School. Lots of research from these two guys. You probably don't um, need me to tell you that. And if you haven't checked out our social channels today, We've actually filled it with lots of resources, um, both academic research, some of their uh, podcasts and TED Talks and that kind of thing. So you might check that out as well. But I'm going to turn it over to the group and and stop talking and let you guys, Pete, Dan, start facilitating. Sure. And, uh, Thank you, Tara. Those, yep. So it's, uh, it's Tara Hepton Stahl heading up uh, marketing and content for Theta. Amazing. Uh, Thanks, I've been Pete. talking about this idea of CLV Day. Again, you could look at the link if you haven't heard me talk about it for a long time, but but uh, actually bringing it to life and uh, creating a, a meaningful conversation and community around it. I can't tell you just uh, how, how important that is to, to us. Uh, and so while we, we label this thing as ask me anything, and we'd love to get your questions, uh, but you know what? We could also make it tell me anything. Uh, we, we just, we're here just to exchange ideas as well as Q&A uh, around the concept, around its applications, around the frontiers uh, of, of the modeling and, and so on. So uh, let, let's just talk. Uh, we're, we're here for you and whoever wants to dive on in and get the party started, we're, we're ready for you. <laughs> And if it makes sense to use a, a raise hand format in addition to people who want to type in questions, but maybe that might be a good way to help with flow control. Yeah, thanks, Dan. I meant to mention that. So if you want to raise your hand, we'll try to get, get folks in some kind of orderly fashion. Um, but that's a good way for us to know you, you want to come off mute and chat. Who is the brave first person to go? <laughs> Jane, sounds like you may have a question. <laughs> <laughs> um, I so just to give you some context, I work with SMBs, and and often there's you know as many as thirteen sources of data from a customer perspective, and I'd love to hear some stories or suggestions as far as when you face a, a context like that. Um, you know, where where do you start? Uh, when you're trying to look at things like LTV and LTP and bring CFOs and CEOs on the journey with you. So I'm happy to jump in uh, first on that. Uh, uh, as, as always, Dan and I will, will have uh, different ideas, hopefully overlapping more often than contradicting, but they'll contradict too. So, uh, you know, you can't jump right into CLV. It, it, it's, it, yeah. it might be the North Star, but, you know, it, it takes a while to get there, to, 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 to get to those heights. Uh, and so it's going to sound a little self-serving. And I'm really not here to, to sell anything. But uh, some folks might be familiar with, with my recent book, 
a customer base audit. Yeah. Uh, and one of the things about the book is that it is, as we like to say, unashamedly descriptive. No models, no forecast, no Greek letters. It's let's just look at the data that we have. Let's look for just the basic patterns of, of how uh, how many customers stay with us, how often they buy, how much they spend, and just just getting to have some comfort level with those basic building block behaviors. Again, without doing any math stuff at all. Uh, first of all, to understand the nature of your customer base, understand the, the, the heterogeneity across your customers, and then to give you enough comfort with it to start saying, hmm, I wonder what's gonna happen next. <laughs> then to start building the models and thinking about the underlying story and, and then the Greek letters and all that. So uh, walk before you run. Uh, I think that's gonna be true, not just for SMBs, for just for any company that's just starting on this journey is, is to just get comfortable with the data, convince, convince yourself that there are some systematic patterns there, patterns that will often align with the kinds of pictures that you see in, in a lot of our, our work, uh, but maybe uh, coming to appreciate some of the exceptions as well. Dan McCarthy. Yep, I fully agree. In some sense, uh, you know, small and medium-sized businesses, they have less cultural debt you know, that they, have been, you know, around in, in a period of time where it's easier to track people. And so you know, they may not be quite as encumbered by legacy systems. And so, um, yeah, so in some sense, it could be easier for them to, to kind of make the leap. But I think as Pete's saying, you know, there, there's actually a colleague of ours who's, um, you know, jumped around in a couple of different companies, uh, but he's, one, one thing that he did, which was kind of very effective at both of his prior companies was to put together, you um, you know, basically some of the descriptives that, that Pete was alluding to, just to kind of, without any model, you know, just to show like, look, we're getting most of our value from a very small percentage of our customers. And I think just, you know, showing that data without a model can, can be very helpful because it, it, it's clear that it's not being driven by any assumptions. You know, it's just kind of inherently how the business has been. And I think that can help create this, wake up moment and like oh man you know we need to really do something that kind of accounts for the fact that uh, so much of our value is coming from such a small percentage of our customer base so yeah, i think that uh, that could be good for getting getting everyone on the same page oh we got some in the chat here why don't we uh, dive in with those so dan you want to take a a, a go at, at edwards yes it's just a question for dan uh in your clb model how how do you account for product virality? A viral product lowers CAC. Um, yeah, I think we're we're kind of watch watch what people do, not what people say or you know what, what the other descriptors are. And so, if you have a product that is viral, um, you know presumably a lot of people are are buying it, <laughs> and so uh, that's going to translate itself into very good metrics, including the lower CAC. So, um, yeah, so, you know, I don't know if the question is how you can kind of create a viral product, but yeah, I would say that the good thing is methods like the ones that we are talking about, you know, the, the goodness of virality will absolutely manifest themselves into the sort of metrics that, uh, that, that we obsess over. And let me add to that. Uh, uh, first of all, I agree with what Dan said that that we our models traditionally tend to be kind of antisocial, <laughs> in that uh, we're going to look at at what each customer did, and there's going to be lots of reasons why they did what they did. Some of which are observable, measurable, incorporatable into the model. Some aren't, uh, and we and really believe that a lot of um, credit that often gets attributed to social is just pure heterogeneity that, that some people are just inherently better than others and they're more connected doesn't necessarily mean that the connections are driving the betterness uh, that if we uh, first allow just for the fact that people are different um, some of the social value might go down a bit that's number one uh, number two uh, I'm working with a PhD student right now, and this is his the heart of his dissertation. Is let's let's try to create that viral component in addition to the heterogeneity, in addition to marketing activities and so on. Can we sort that piece out uniquely? 
that's there's some real nasty, hairy, beautiful, delicious math there. Uh, if if if, you, if you're interested in in maybe uh, contributing some data for his dissertation and a nice quid pro quo, happy to talk about that so we can take it offline. Uh, and then we'll just add one other piece to it because I hope there'll be a lot of questions about CAC uh, and I'll defer on all of them to Dan. Uh, and I just want to question that assumption that viral virality necessarily lowers CAC, especially if you're doing things to engender that virality. If you're hiring influencers or if you're you're doing different kinds of marketing activities that are ex explicitly aimed at, at uh, getting people to spread the word, um, that's not costless. Uh, so just, just be real careful about it. Just because you get those viral wheels spinning doesn't mean they're, they're happening for free in the first place. Yeah, I guess the two other comments, and again, it's just kind of making sure that I fully understand what the question is. Um, you know, more broadly speaking, there's just the concept of network effects, and that need not be purely about virality or even social but you know just some businesses they have two sides to the network or even three and uh and it can be that you know having more people on the other side of the network can improve the utility for people on the other side of the network um and so you know that that's certainly you know that's an interesting area of academic research as, as Pete's alluding to um but I think it is kind of an empirical question first if you have the observable data to even be able to pin down such a model and if you can't, then I think you have to kind of make do with the best of what you got. Um, but I would say, you know, uh, to your uh, other point, um, network effects would actually lead to sustainably, you know, potentially decreasing CAC over time. And so, um, yeah, so that really can kind of work both ways. But I think you're absolutely right. If, if you're referring to virality in the sense that someone has a, a really popular ad that just connects, lots of people view it and you see some spurt of activity, um, then I think you absolutely can incorporate something like that into a model. Um, obviously, oftentimes you'd be kind of doing that in the rear view mirror. <laughs> and so it's gonna be hard to expect that you're gonna be able to do that again. But I think that also speaks to the importance of having something in your model that allows you to isolate out the effect of that thing. Because if you don't, then you say, whoa, you know, some piece of that viral ad, we're going to see that going forward, and uh, and and you may not. And so you really need to uh, incorporate time varying covariates into your COE model, you know, which I think is one of the unique differentiators uh, that, that we at Data have. Well, let's keep going. Got a good list here. Uh, uh, so uh, Amanda posted a question. Amanda, I, I'd, I'd love you to clarify, because you're using the words historical COV. Uh, and and th th and that that word uh, ha has particular meaning to us. Uh, in fact, I want to point out some of the amazing resources that Dan has put out there, and just in coming up very very careful definitions. Of, in fact, Dan, I'm not going to steal your thunder. Why don't you talk a bit about uh, careful definitions of CLV? Yeah, just so no. You know, Thank you. Go ahead. Yeah, maybe you, you go for it. Yeah, and then we'll uh, yeah, then then. No, thanks for the time. So uh, I'm I'm saying that like. Uh, I work for a venture capital fund, magic word, LTV to CAC, trying to convince companies of using like fully loaded CAC, at least like, including all the right costs on the CAC. But when it comes to LTV, uh, we still see companies using gross values instead of any profit metric. That, that's one. Uh, and there are some like craziness assumptions like, okay, 60 months is the lifetime value, but what is lifetime? So especially for non-contractual relations, uh, even companies that it should be like easy to calculate how, how much each customer you already have is worth, they still cannot do it. So I, I want to try to set like the minimum basis, at least uh, within our fund. So we can work back, like we couldn't work from that until we have a model that can actually predict future behavior until companies understand the value of it. So, but right now we are still like very early days where I'm getting gross revenue multiplied by crazy number. Mm. Yep. Yeah, I think that we, we have a series of kind of historic, we call them variants of CLV. And so they wouldn't be CLV per se, but they would be things that relate to customer value that can be diagnostic. 
and uh, and there's a whole host of them. So I'd be more than happy to share uh, a deck that I think people may be referring to that goes through some of them. Um, but it goes everything from CAC to kind of um, day zero profitability, where you're kind of netting the contribution profit associated with the order that burst that customer against the CAC, all the way forward to, you know, really as far as you can go, where you have cohorts <clears throat> and you're just taking all the data from the oldest cohorts up until today, you know? And so for some cohorts that are five years old, you'll be able to go out five years. Um, for the young cohorts, you'll be able to go out less far. Um, but we, you know, we call those kind of finite horizon uh, contribution profit based, um, either CLVs or PAVs. And we'll kind of look at both separately. And I think those are probably, um, yeah, I'm sure that there's a number of other measures that we can look at, but those are going to be very helpful to focus on if we want to go, kind of go all the way up to the point of running a model, but uh, but not quite. And, and I think in, in general, uh, it's, it's great to see firms talking more about it. Uh, it's great to see them being held a little bit more accountable if they start talking about it. Like, wait a minute, Ed, how did you measure that? More pushback and not just fine, you know, you, you check the box. Because uh, I, I I, I, there's no question you'd have the, the data, the, the smarts, the sophistication to be able to do it right. But a lot of folks just uh, either aren't taking it seriously enough, uh, they just haven't invested the resources to assemble the right kind of data or the right kind of analytical capabilities. Uh, so it's, it's great to see people starting to talk about it, but we want to have make it an intelligent conversation, uh, both within and across organizations. So it's, it's, it's good to see you striving in that direction, and we'd love to help you get there. And maybe three final things, just, uh, you know, we, we talked about some of those measures, but then there's the question of, you know, what is CAC? And you mentioned fully loaded CAC, great to hear reference to it. I'd say the, the second step that can be nice is to disentangle acquisition related marketing spend from the marketing spend that's driving the repeat orders. Take that second slug of marketing and ding the contribution margin for it. Take the first slug of marketing and have that drive CAC. Um, for some businesses, it could be actually kind of hard even to define revenue. <laughs> so you talk about some of these delivery businesses there's a whole bunch of pass through in there. And so everything from gross order value to revenue on a fully net basis, um, you know, you see some companies doing one thing, some doing another, but then whatever you decide, however you decide to define revenue, then the next question is how you define contribution profit. And um, is, it, is it gross profit? Is it gross profit minus X? If so, what is X? Um, so, in general, I think our rule of thumb is to incorporate all of the, the variable expenses. And so that could be payment processing, you know, et cetera, et cetera. It could be expenses that, you know, seem kind of like overhead, but tend to grow with revenue. Uh, but, you know, you just want to really be, you're kind of careful and conservative in how you, how you define that. So, um, yeah, definitely looking forward to having that conversation uh, on, on that upcoming I encourage you to, to uh, read Dan's content on, on Twitter and LinkedIn, like even opening stores uh, often viewed as pure fixed costs, but there's a lot of customer costs baked in there. And a message that, that Dr. McCarthy is putting out there all the time. Uh, and it's just, it's just really, really important to, uh, when in doubt, keep it in. <laughs> there, there probably is some customer costs associated with it. Here, here. All right, let's go to this this ne next one on the list here, maybe. Oh man, this is the, you're talking to academics here. We just, we run into this all day long. <laughs> you got some data, you're fitting your model and uh, it just doesn't validate right, damn it. <laughs> yeah, I still remember with the, the, the non-subscription CBCB paper, just getting that damn thing to fit properly. You know, we had a, we spent so much time on that model. Um, but yeah, I think, you know, for one, it, focusing on the right validation plots and really getting to the essence of what it is that's, that's missing, you know, and typically if you kind of understand the range of motion of your model, you know, that there's just some behaviors and dynamics that, that it may be able to incorporate and some that it's not, and that can help you when you kind of look at 
how you're missing or, or where you're missing, you know, that can help really understand um, what it is you may want to bring into your model or, or, or take out of your model uh, to, to kind of help remedy that issue. I think what we wouldn't recommend, which can very often be the, the default knee-jerk reaction, is to just start throwing in a whole bunch of covariates. And, uh, you know, you got this covariate for this month and then for that month. And then, you know, we, we see this other thing over here. And, you know, the problem is, you know, oftentimes it's kind of putting um, lipstick on a pig, you know, that there's some underlying issue that you're just trying to paper over with kind of arbitrary covariates. And it's going to be uh, potentially a lot less likely to, to generalize. <clears throat> hey, Dan. Uh, yeah, it also depends on what you mean by not working. Uh, so, uh, for, for instance, it could very well be that the model is doing a pretty good job of capturing the overall baseline of, of sales for a particular cohort over time. But any given week, you know, there's going to be a lot of noise or marketing activity that's creating wiggles and jiggles. And any given week, we're off. We're too high. We're too low. But we're capturing the long run pretty well. So we have to be real careful how we, what again, what, what criteria we use, what pictures we look at. And sometimes just a simple tracking plot. Uh, might not be as as indicative as, as you might think. Here's another one. Yeah, this was the direction I thought you were going to go in, although I completely agree with that. Um, imagine you just computed some individual level RMSE statistic and you compared your method to a random forest and just kind of called it a day. It could be that the random forest looks better along that metric, but doesn't mean that that model is any good. Uh, and so you really want to be careful with how you're kind of thinking about the performance of your model. And especially when you go down to individual level uh, kind of error measures with data that's as sparse as the data that we often work with, um, it can be extraordinarily sensitive to the error measure that you use. So you just wanna be real careful with that. <clears throat> hey, Dan, sorry, I wanna chime in because we actually have four folks with their hands raised. Um, so I'm gonna start with Barath. Um, if you wanna come off mute. Thanks. Sure, sure. Thank you very much, uh, Tara. Uh, so, Dr. Uh, McCarthy, uh, really enjoyed your uh, articles on LinkedIn. Really inspiring, really inspiring, quite inspiring. So, here's a quick question. Maybe this is, I'm, I might be derailing the conversation a little bit, but I'm looking for some insight from you. So, uh, I'm an aspiring entrepreneur and I've been trying to follow and make sense of the whole uh, lifetime value conversation and then also the conversation around subscriptions. Right. So my understanding of this area is this, uh, that there is just so many subscription services uh, being launched with this perspective of gaining the lifetime value of a customer over a period of time. And when I talk to people around me, they're hitting a number on their budgets where they can't budge or they can't move any further on adding on more subscriptions to their particular uh, existing uh, you know, lifestyle. And they're having to pull things. So is this a race to the bottom or what's happening here in this space? I, I know this is a very broad question because it can kind of breaks down into streaming and health and fitness and uh, educational, so on and so forth. So any insights you can share on this, I think that'll be really great and Pete please also do uh try to chime in yeah I know a lot of people talk about subscription fatigue as being uh, a real thing and um and I do think it's uh something that we've all personally potentially experienced ourselves you know where you kind of look at your credit card statement one day and you realize holy crap I'm signed up for how many different <laughs> streaming services <laughs> so yeah I think that's absolutely real um yeah I think there's not a whole lot of work on on subscription fatigue in the academic community. Yeah, I think that it is kind of an interesting area, but kind of hard to write about uh, that would pass kind of the peer review process. Um, so yeah, I, kind of my personal belief is that it's one of those things where um, it kind of goes on for a while, and then you kind of re have this moment of realization that um, you know, you're kind of very heavily subscribed, and then you may cancel a number of services at the same time. Um, yeah, I think there's a question again, it goes back to one of the earlier questions about virality, and that is the observability of the data. You know, so imagine that you are an entrepreneur and you're starting a subscription business and you're kind of concerned about this as being, um, you know, something that may make it difficult to start or, you know, to have 
to have good retention because you know, you're kind of launching a service when there's a whole bunch of other subscriptions that are out there. Um, credit card panel data or other data sources can be helpful um, in that they can allow you to actually see you know, how many people are signed up for how many subscriptions and how that's been evolving over you know, the past, you know, call it seven years. Uh, so I think, you know, that that's something that can at least shed some light on, on the issue. But um, yeah, I think ultimately, you know, it's a relatively slow moving um, thing. So I would imagine that you know, to the extent that you are already running a subscription business and you're kind of seeing your retention patterns, you know, hopefully it's not something that should just kind of blow you up one day. You know, in general, you would expect that to already be kind of manifesting itself into your retention curves. Oh, yeah, three points, uh, if I may. Um, I'm actually somewhat skeptical about all the claims of subscription fatigue. Uh, I think a, a couple of things. Number one, um, the idea that people will, will uh, try things and drop them is completely common. We see that in every aspect of business. So even in non-subscription settings, your modal buyer is one and done. So why shouldn't it be the same with subscriptions? That doesn't mean fatigue, it just means it's not meeting my needs. Uh, so, uh, so I wanna be careful about uh, when we see churn taking place about the, the reasons we ascribe to it. Uh, number two, a part of it goes back to, to, to what Jan just said. It's going to be a slow moving kinds of thing where it's not necessarily going to show up within a particular cohort of customers. It's going to be a cross cohort thing that the, the customers that we acquire in the last quarter are going to be different, generally worse than the ones that we acquired previously. As we start scraping the barrel, we don't have people lining up around the block wanting to get this thing. doesn't mean that we're failing. It just means that their customers who just aren't as good. Uh, and number three, uh, it could be the issue is, is less on the consumer side and more the fact that people are trying to subscriptionize, sassify everything, including things that really shouldn't be. Like, you know, when, when, when BMW wants to make you pay a subscription fee for, for heated seats. I mean, really? Uh, so again, that, that's less about us getting tired of it, more about just things that were kind of, you know, uh, born to fail. So I, I think I, I would be careful about jumping to conclusions. It, it's faddish to talk about subscription fatigue, but I'm not sure I've seen a lot of hard evidence about it um, that couldn't be explained through one of these other factors. Yeah, put it this way. I think that if you had good CLV modeling, you wouldn't need an explicit subscription fatigue factor. You know, I think that you know, to Pete's point, you're going to see some cross cohort degradation, which we always do. And to the extent that, you know, people kind of look at their credit card statement when they start feeling financial pressure and they say, oh, crap, um, that's going to probably be picked up by a time factor, you know, probably you know, related to the economy. So I don't and I, I don't think that you'd also be able to, to separately identify some factor like that versus a recessionary factor. You know, I think that it's just going to you know, potentially lead to a higher coefficient estimate. Why don't we turn to Alejo's question here? Um, uh, partially, um, uh, say, I want to thank thank you, Alejo, for all the, the great uh, uh, LinkedIn content you've been putting out there. We're reading it, we're seeing it, we're reposting it. So thanks to you and, and, and all of you who are actually uh, finding your own voice to kind of get some of these messages out there, um, as well as calling attention to some of our own work. So, so it's a really great question uh, that, yeah, so uh, we talk all the time about coming up with the CLV magic wand or pen um, to say, here's the value of each and every customer. But does that necessarily mean that we need to, uh, to, to use the models at that level? Uh, and that, that idea of, of hyper-personalization, uh, I think, tends to be a bad thing. That, that we really have to ask ourselves, uh, instead of how granular can we get, it's really how granular do we need to get? <laughs> Uh, uh, so I'd, I'd rather uh, kind of start from the top down and, and say, all right, we've got we, no doubt we need to kind of fine tune uh, our, our, our targeting and, and our measurement and so on. But, but Occam's razor always applies. And once we get low enough that we're achieving good results and we're seeing big differences uh, across customers for a particular campaign, stop. <laughs> Just because the data analytics and technology allow us to go further doesn't mean we should. Yeah, all right, maybe we try run an experiment to say, is there incremental ROI on doing so? And the answer is often no. 
so I think it, a lot of those, those efforts really are counterproductive. And that's a real problem because if we're using the CLE models and then we're kind of slicing the bologna too thin, uh, and so we're, 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 we're achieving a less effective results. We're kind of often raising our costs and the complexity of doing so. It's gonna sometimes get people to throw the baby out with the bathwater and say, you know what, we don't need all that CLV stuff. Well, it's not that the CLV stuff is bad, it's that you're just going too far with it. So we want, uh, we want people to be just really disciplined about how they approach this. And again, um, don't presume that, that you need to, to get down to that one-to-one -one level because it's rare that you need to. And if you're not, then your error measure should not be at the individual level, right? Because it doesn't make sense. You don't need to achieve that level of accuracy. It's not a relevant level of accuracy. And it introduces a whole host of other complicating factors like we talked about just a moment ago. And so if you know that you can only target at the level of the micro segment, then evaluate your ability to predict at the micro segment level. Yeah, if I can uh, maybe uh, let Martin come off mute. He's put a question in the Q&A window, um, but also raised his hand. So Martin, if you want to jump in with your question. Sure. Um, hi. Uh, again, thanks for all the all the great work you've you've done in, in CLV. It's it's been super useful. Um, and uh, I I wanted to have uh, understand how, how would you go about leveraging uh, customer acquisition cost and, and and customer lifetime value in in setting marketing budgets. So let's say you would already have some estimates about the total addressable market, and you know that you might want to reach. Uh, achieve a certain market share in, in certain amount of time. What's the best way to start uh, triangulating that down? Because that's that's a very practical thing you'd want to do as a business. That's a hard question. <laughs> you know, it's, it's interesting that, that most of the models that we'll build, uh, they're descriptive, they're predictive. Uh, but then going that next level, say, okay, now that we have, let's say, all these CLV estimates uh, and the impact of uh, whether it's marketing activities or other things associated with CLV. So now how do we go spreading that budget around? It, it's something that, that always kind of vexed me that, 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 that we uh, often stop short of, of answering that question. Uh, we've developed much stronger capabilities in, in recent years. Uh, I'll give a big shout out to a former student of mine uh, and, a, and, a, and a, actually a co-author of, of Dan's, a, a guy named Eric Schwartz, at the University of Michigan, where uh, I took my course as a freshman, and I said, "Okay, Eric, um, for, for the next, you know, whatever it was, six, seven years, you're here as an undergrad and a PhD student. We want you to figure that part out: is, is how do we layer optimization on top of these predictive, descriptive models, uh, and 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 borrowing a lot of aspects from computer science. Uh, those of you who might be familiar with." Uh, with bandit algorithms, uh, if you're familiar with the, the armed bandit problem. If you're not, we're not going to hold you up, but it's, uh, it's something worth reading into. And things like Thompson sampling and so on, trying to, to find that, 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 uh, that best blend of, of optimization that actually takes into account the, the, the real structure of our models and gives you some, uh, some, some direct guidance about uh, the, the right ways to allocate a budget and how to keep updating those allocations as we start getting uh, uh, limited feedback from the marketplace. So there really is a nice kind of hand in glove relationship between that. Of course, the specific answer to your question, Martin, is it depends. <laughs> uh, it's, it's really hard to, to offer a broad directional advice. It'd be really great to say, well, here's how you should allocate your budget across acquisition, retention and development. But it, it, I think it's still too early and there's still too many differences across companies to give even any kind of remote rule of thumb about how to do that. Uh, but at least we have the, the, the methods in place that, that facilitate it. Yeah, in, in, interesting. There are these uh, all, all sorts of different rules, right? Like like the three to one ratios and rule of forty and all, all, all those things. So it's it's not very clear where those come from, but you know, there's. Uh, People want to figure it out, some some simpler rules of them. So. Yeah, I think one thing that you'll want to really make sure of is exactly what CAC measure you're talking about. Is it an average CAC measure or is it something that's supposed to be marginal, you know, that can be kind of leaned on is if you were to bring in that next customer, if you were to spend the next 50 bucks, is that gonna 
be what it takes to bring in the customer. Um, and as soon as you start moving towards allocation, you really want to be thinking about marginal CAC. Yeah, I think average CAC, it's very good for the sort of thing that we do with customer-based corporate valuation. Um, but it's just going to be lumping in all the acquisitions that you would have gotten without any marketing with all the ones that you got from your marketing. And it says, you know, these are how much we spent. This is what we brought in. <laughs> and uh, it's actually surprisingly predictive. Uh, so, but yeah, it's just, it's not going to be helpful for reallocation. Uh, so if you want to really focus on reallocation, you need to know your, your marginal CACs and you need to start thinking about things like, you know, attribution models. But uh, yeah, it gets, it gets a lot trickier. Uh, so there's certainly things you can do, but um, you're going to need to do a lot more than, you know, just kind of customer level repeat purchase prediction. All right, maybe we can take Brian's question if he wants to come off mute. Sure. Can you hear me? Yes, sir. Thanks. Okay. Excellent. So uh, in, in thinking about subscription fatigue, I'm thinking back to my marketing uh, 476 final project. I looked at subscription services where customers actually have to select one type of competitor. So I use tax preparation providers where there are a few in the market and it's, it's a guarantee, you know, death and taxes. And so we had customers that churned and then they returned uh, many times over decades. And I called them zombie customers when they rose from the dead years later. Um, so you might have the initial relationship and then you'd have some sort of expectation of the expected uh, residual transactions that you would have if you could get them to come back from the competitor. Um, if you could get someone to come back from doing their taxes by themselves or hiring an accountant and come back to H&R Block or Liberty Tax, et cetera, which had some very good data. So, um, and, and this this kind of rolls into the, the question that I have right now where I'm working on a financial services marketing strategy. And the goal of the, the corporation is to, to get people in the door. So for example, offering um, credit cards to students, uh, offering student loans, um, uh, checking accounts. But then the idea is to keep them for life. So you have mortgages and 529 plans and uh, HELOCs, et cetera. And so on a very meta level, you can look at the customer relationship as lifelong. And that when you put that all together, it, it provides you with a customer's li lifetime value that 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 is it it justifies that high cost of acquisition to get them in the door, but in reality these are separate products these are separate services. Um, uh, at what point does it make sense to split the acquisition and the CLV models into distinct products or buckets, um, especially when when doing so makes that initial acquisition. Um, not necessarily profitable. And so you can't justify any new customer acquisition. Uh, the models essentially say, focus all your marketing on existing people, existing customers, and just try to upsell them as opposed to going out into the market if you don't lump everything together. So what are your thoughts there, especially when you're looking over multiple decades? Brian's heard plenty from me. So uh, Dan, you want to go first? Yeah, it's a pretty hard question. Uh, I do think there are a lot of businesses that are kind of banking on these really long run relationships and, and maybe they'll pay off. But, uh, you know, I think there is a question of, yeah, you know, how much of it is getting a, a repeat purchase, as we would say, versus having to kind of reacquire the customer. And, um, you know, to the extent that you are able to hold on to those customers for the entire time, um, you know, then there would be no reacquisition. Uh, but, you know, we had a, a little bit of this sort of conversation with Casper, you know, we were talking about this direct to consumer mattress company and uh, they have a lot of people who they acquire and then, you know, you don't buy a mattress for 10 years and then you buy your next one. And yeah, I think the, the point that, that we were making at the time was um, when they're making that decision to buy their next mattress, they're going to probably go through the full adoption process. Again, you're going to probably have to spend, um, you know, comparable, to, to what you had originally spent. And so, you know, you could call that a repeat purchase, but it's effectively going to have the same marketing intensity as the initial acquisition, in which case you probably would be fine just modeling it as a reacquisition. Now that wouldn't be great for a company like this, obviously, you know, you'd hope that there is some sort of enduring benefit, but that really is something to be tested. And the problem is, um, 
if you really are talking multiple decades, like you're saying, then a young company is going to have zero data to be, with which to validate that uh, assumption. And so, so you may want to operate under the assumption that, you know, maybe it's not going to happen. You know, maybe it's you're not going to have that that sort of multi-decade sort of loyalty benefit. Um, and uh, yeah, just it, it might be a little bit prudent. <clears throat> That's that be my thought. <laughs> I don't know, Pete. Sure. Two two quick points to add. Uh, uh, one is that we often overstate the notion of a relationship. We feel just because we sold something to someone, we have a relationship with them. In many cases, they don't feel that way. <laughs> I gave you money, you gave me a thing, that's it. It was a fair trade. There's no relationship here. Um, uh, so that idea of having to you know, reacquire customers, it's not necessarily a, a failing on anyone's part. It's that a lot of customers really are one and done and okay, and then they come back again. But that's just how it is. Uh, this, you should almost expect that to be more rule than exception. That's number one. Number two, uh, one of our favorite models in, in our, with our previous company, Zodiac, um, we, we built out our, our multi-service model where we're basically uh, looking specifically at how people are, are kind of adding and dropping, whether it's, it's financial services or telecommunication services over time. And that's an important point is that we like to believe that all they're doing is adding, 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 uh, but, it, but, it, but they're dropping too. So the, the, the bundle of services doesn't necessarily grow over time. It changes. Uh, and so it, it's just important to uh, to recognize that people will often uh, let go for various reasons. You know, they, they don't need that particular financial product anymore. It's that's again not your fault. Uh, so I, I think it, it, we should approach these things more realistically. Very often in financial services settings, I'll see terrible activities where companies will pay whatever it takes to acquire a customer, and then say, so you know what? Now we're going to educate them to love us, so that they'll get the auto loan and then the mortgage and then the then the boat loan and everything else. And that's just, it doesn't work that way. Lifetime value doesn't tend to work like this. It tends more to work like this. We need to expect that going in. Right. The, the interesting thing is you have companies like American Express that open up lounges and airports in order to keep that relationship. And there's tons of information about all the financial services that American Express has in the Centurion Lounge, if you can get in, um, but you don't necessarily see um, some of the lesser uh, financial organizations, but um, you 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 uh, suggested at the beginning that that we share some things. I, I want to uh, throw out one last thing. I worked for a company that focused on um, uh, making investments in loss prevention in retail, and I used customer lifetime value uh, as a flip side. As what is the cost of deterring a criminal? So if you can catch somebody and put them in jail for two years, what is the lifetime value of deterring someone from stealing from your store. <laughs> so if you have uh, recidivists, you know, what is the uh, lifetime recidivist value of a customer? So instead of looking at it and saying, you'll save $100 or $200 by having a security guard, you can look at it and say, well, over the lifetime, we're going to save thousands of dollars by having this security guard. So it was, um, it really changed the way that, uh, that we thought. And we had great data to, to back up um, how much these recidivists uh, actually implemented and, and the drops that, that we would see while people were in prison or in custody. It was, uh, and it, it sparked a lot of investment in safety, which uh, it's an interesting way. They call it red metrics versus green metrics. I so just kind that. of flip it around. Okay, thanks, Brian. We've had uh, other examples like that where it's, it's, uh, uh, it's not so much buy till you die, but you know, um, you know, watching things happen until they get better. Uh, as a wildly unrelated example, uh, uh, one of our the favorites that Daniel remembers is one we did with pediatric asthma. So, you know, how many uh, prescriptions of albuterol will you need uh, until your wind windpipes expand enough that you don't need it anymore? So it's, it's kind of fun to often uh, take these models, not only and turn them on their head, but to use them in these wildly unrelated <laughs> domains uh, and seeing just as much success with them as in the domains where they were originally intended. And it's examples like health healthcare. Where we'll talk about the the CLV of of a patient in a hospital or in the medical system. And then there, I think there's the question of, so what is it that we're actually trying to do with this number? You know, and it's kind of actually quite tricky. Uh, it's like you want to extend the lifetime as long as possible, 
but uh, but you don't want the cost to be very high. So it, it wouldn't quite be CLV minimization, but this weird combination of minimizing the monetary value per unit of <laughs> of additional lifetime or something. <clears throat> yeah, non valuable externalities there. Yes. Yeah. So I'm gonna uh, lean in. You... I'm, I'm gonna lean in one more time because we right. have 15 minutes and about 11 questions. Lightning round. Yeah. So let's let Phil come off mute. He's been waiting. He and Will have been waiting patiently. So and then we'll go back to the Q and A window, and you can start sorting through those. So Phil, be real yeah. quick. <laughs> yep. <laughs> this is a Thank great you. one, by the way. Yeah, this is an awesome way to celebrate CLV Day. This is uh, this is a lot of fun. Uh, thank you. My name is Phil Sherman. I, I work for a large um, PNC and financial services company, and I've actually had the privilege of uh, supporting our uh, internal LTV models uh, going back to around 2017 um, and have been on a one man um, crusade at times, it feels like, to align our nominal strategy uh, or um, to to help us make sure that our nominal strategy um, actually executes what we what we say it is in a way that uh, could be reflected in our LTV, um, and even uh, had a meeting with my with my pastor probably five or six years ago to talk to him about LTV of our um, of our church members, um, but kind of changing gears not not insurance. Um, but I was curious, uh, going back to like the direct to consumer uh, type model, because that seems to be extremely popular um, with the ease of kind of launching a, a business. Um, other than the customer acquisition cost, because I know that's near and dear to your hearts, what's maybe the first uh, two or three metrics that you would really hone in on? Um, um, in kind of the maybe pre-launch and launch of a company and then starting to transition into a maturing uh, company and what's kind of that transition through those metrics. And uh, media thoughts, Tim? Yeah, I mean, it, I think it also, it, it depends on the type of business, uh, but certainly if, if you're young, um, I mean, it, it could be great to get some indication of, yeah, how much repeat business you can expect from your customers. And so um, you know, some measure that proxies for that. By construction, young companies, the challenge is that you have so little data. And so you don't have the luxury of one and a half year old cohorts, which we like to have when we're kind of doing our repeat purchase modeling, at least to be able to lean on them for the young customers here. We don't have those at all. So yeah, I think getting proxies like that, um, because you're young, if you're in a category where there are incumbents, then again, you can look to credit card panel data and see um, how your measures compare to what the analogous measures are for other companies that are doing well. Yeah, I think that those can help fill in some of the blanks as to what the, the norms should be and how you compare to them. So I think that that could be valuable. The other thing when you're young that's a little different from when you're older is you don't have the luxury of having a boatload of cash oftentimes. And so you may want to be a little bit more careful with you know, with your cash and with how quickly you can kind of redeploy money that you spend to acquire customers. So again, things like, um, do you get your money back in terms of contribution profit on your acquisition dollars uh, very quickly or not? I mean, I think that those are measures that, yeah, you, know, you always want to pay attention to them. We obviously want to go towards lifetime value, but again, the, the shorter amount of history you have, the less you can kind of really bank on multi-year you know, payouts. It's just not something that you have the luxury of of knowing. Um, so you know, I think those short term measures can become a little bit more more valuable there. Hey Dan, wanna... might be. Oh, sorry, I was just going to say it might be worth mentioning the blog you have coming up with Rodrigo because I think this is a relevant, uh, you know, topic that folks can check our website on hmm. later. Yeah, this week. coming out again. Mm -hmm. We want to keep each of these answers on the shorter side, but. Uh, the piece, one of the other things that it advocates for is this idea that uh, you should work backwards. And, um, and so the idea here is 
you know, have some targets in mind as to what success would be for your type of business, those measures of success, I think, can be based on the the peers in your space, you know, the main competitors that you think are doing well or, or that you think you can kind of outperform and then kind of work your way back into, well, how, how do I get there? You know, and you can kind of see what it would take to be able to do that. So things that you have control over, like your pricing, you know, those are things that you can kind of manipulate. Same with, um, you know, the, the cost of your goods, uh, how much you want to kind of rely on, on paid marketing, uh, especially earlier on relative to organic marketing to kind of keep your cap down. So those are all things that are kind of within your control. But yeah, we'll have more on that in, in the upcoming piece. <clears throat> let's keep going. All right, let's let Will go because he's been waiting and then I'm going to go back to the Q&A screen. Will? Hi, yo. Can you hear me? Yes. Right here. Uh, I actually recently switched jobs over to at and I was working as a business appraiser before uh, for a few years and my background's uh, in math, uh, my educational backgrounds in math and computer science. So uh, when my boss told me to check out uh, a paper that you two had written together, um, it was very uh, enlightening. It was very interesting uh, to read it and um, I, I enjoyed it. Uh, I had a question about um, perpetuity and, and uh, terminal value uh, with, with customer lifetime value. Um, what are your thoughts on that? Do you avoid it and say, you know, except for extreme circumstances, you shouldn't expect this customer is going to be around for the rest of their life. Um, or, uh, you know, I, I know in that paper that I did read, it was um, more of a total volume of customers uh, and, and how they come in and out. And then you multiply the revenue by that, the number of customers. So it's not at the individual level. Uh, but if you were to do an LTV um, at the individual level, uh, what are your thoughts on the the terminal value in that. So a couple of things. Well, if 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 it's the paper I'm thinking about, um, even though there's aggregate data, it's still a model specified at the individual level. So mm -hmm. that's just a data issue. But we're still telling our story as if we had a granular data about each individual. Most of the models we'll build are going to be uh, truly at that that granular level. It's it's important to be able to sort out individual level propensities, heterogeneity across them, dynamics over time, if you really want to um, then build up to an aggregate level. So, so number one, it is, it is individual level. Number two, I'm a big fan of perpetuities, uh, which is to say, uh, if we really believe in lifetime value, and, and I'm not going to play God, I think Morgan Freeman's doing a great job with that. So, uh, uh, so we want to allow for the possibility that this relationship could last forever. And just bring in that stochastic element to say, but you could drop out at any given point in time. Uh, it's just going to be not only more um, realistic to, 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 to not play God and, and say when people are going to, to drop out or to have some kind of you know, finite terminal value, um, but, but believe it or not, the, the, the math works out better that we can get these closed form solutions that will actually be easier to implement. The models will work better and they'll scale much greater by, by going uh, infinite horizon with stochastic dropout, as opposed to trying to calculate some terminal value. And if we wanted to calculate a terminal value, great thing is we can easily do that. We can basically say, you know, what would the NPV be at a certain point in time? So by going infinite, we can, uh, we can do the terminal value thing, but you can't go the other way around. Mm -hmm. yeah, just a few other thoughts on that. I think, um... You know, for one, if you have a discount rate, especially in this sort of in income, in this sort of inflation environment, after you go out five or so years, 10% discount rate, you know, again, just because of inflation, it's going to really blunt the effect of those outer years. And so hopefully the model should not be really banking on what happens in year 10 or year 20, you know, so I think that's a, that's a good thing. Um, where it can run and where it can be tricky is with these SaaS companies, you know, because there you'll have, you know, 50% on average uh, increase in revenue per, per cohort as the cohort gets older for five, seven, nine years. And so you can end up with these situations where you end up either kind of saying that the cohort's great or, or stinks based on what happens um, really far out into the future. And that's just something to be very mindful of. Um, 
if you had age data, yeah, you know, I'd say we had one case where we actually had pretty much all the age data as well. Then you, <laughs> what we did in that case was uh, at the individual level, we got the actuarial table for, you know, when it would be that we would kind of expect that person to, to, to die. And if the expected lifetime was longer than that, we would truncate it to that point. Uh, so, you know, if, if that data is available, then great, but typically it's not. <clears throat> It's really helpful. Uh, yeah, yeah, I'd actually, that was one of the things I had brought up uh, to my boss when I first came on because I had done some uh, modeling for uh, retirement, uh, expected retirement outcomes. And my first thought was, well, if we have ages of these customers. We know at some point um, they're not going to be customers and we should use that data. Uh, but that makes sense on, on both areas. So stochastic, stochastic dropout, um, I think that's something that uh, we should look into. So I appreciate that. Thank you. It's a sad thing. You know, we had in this business, it was uh, a business that sold, like it was like health supplements. And so you had these great customers that have been around for, you know, 10 years. And then you see they're 95 years old and you say, well, 10 years of consistent purchase behavior. They're amazing, you know, <laughs> but, but if they're 95, you know, it's going to be hard to kind of expect that many more years. Right. Value. Sorry. Right. Yeah. All right. Second. See what see what you guys can do with the questions left in the Q and A window. I want to yeah, jump into the start. second one. Okay. Uh, BQID uh, versus ML. Um, I, I want to point out that there's no reason why you have to choose. Uh, that that uh, a lot of the work that we've been doing recently is using the BTYD as kind of the kind of kernel model, saying that's going to give you the baseline, and using different kinds of uh, ML approaches on top of that to explain the wiggles and jiggles around that, that BTYD baseline. It's a very powerful combination and give just a huge shout out to, to Ian Frankenberg on our Theta team for basically doing just that. I think it's just a phenomenal piece of work to have again, instead of just leveraging the ML to do the heavy lifting, let's do the BTYD for that. But there's still gonna be a lot left over and then bring in appropriate ML procedures uh, can be not only extremely effective, but but retain the extraordinary computational benefits that we see from the BTYD models. Well, yeah, and this, uh, the other kind of small point I make is at the cohort level, it becomes a lot easier to use some of the ML type approaches, the autoregressive ones that can get at the time series structure of the problem. Um, as soon as you go to the individual level, it just gets a lot harder. You know, I'd say that you start thinking about these embeddings and when you have such sparse data, uh, it just becomes really hard to use these things. So um, you really want to be careful there. And you can have very big differences in performance uh, at the cohort level uh, versus at the individual level. Pick one, Dan. Uh, maybe I'll try to take the first one just because I haven't read them all. <laughs> um, developing cohort retention projections and go forward CLV, how do you correct for past stockouts and potential sales capture rate improvements? Yeah, again, there's kind of a question of observability. Um, and how much how much it matters uh, at the cohort level, you know. So if we're kind of modeling a cohort, as uh, as we'll typically do, obviously it ends up going down to the individual level. But a lot of things like stockouts, you would imagine, would kind of just end up getting soaked up in the unobserved heterogeneity. And so you're going to kind of see these general behaviors. And obviously, if the stockouts are at least somewhat random over time, then yeah, I think oftentimes that will just kind of shake itself out and you won't necessarily need to really explicitly incorporate uh, something at the at the individual level. Um, if you did have some sort of variable, like, you know, capture rate tends to be improving over time. If it's the capture rate that I'm thinking about, like, you know, in, in a grocery store, now you're capturing more of the transactions that are happening in the store, then you, that's certainly something you're going to want to put in because that's going to be moving up over time. Um, so again, you kind of need observable data to be able to incorporate that in. Uh, you could incorporate that in through a covariate at the very least. And, and let me just add, if, if those of you uh, aren't familiar with it already, I'm Dan, along with another uh, former student of mine, Shino Blander, has an extraordinary new paper, just accepted, not published yet, where they try to identify COVID effects uh, within and across cohorts. So it really is the, the very same idea. And by, by looking at, at the data very, very carefully, you can start to get a clean read on these kinds of externalities. Highly recommended. Um, we, we can send a link to the paper and even to some, some wonderful 
uh, presentations that, that that Dan has has given about it. If the event is a discrete shock, mm -hmm. discrete. I'll just leave it at discrete. <laughs> So we're at time. Um, I, I know probably you, you guys have places to go. Um, and we had a few questions left. So I think aside from one that was anonymous, there were names from the folks who had submitted them. So perhaps we can commit to some kind of follow up with you guys who submitted a question that we couldn't get to. Um, this is our first time doing this as a group. So um, our challenge might always be timing. <laughs> Um, but want to thank you all, Dan, Pete. Do you guys want to make any final yeah. inspirational say, comments? Yeah, th thank you, Tara, for making this 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 possible. But uh, if any of you want to engage with us in other ways, whether it's doing another session like this or wh whatever it would take to just help you better understand the nature of the models and the commercial applications of them, uh, please reach out to us. You see the the QR code and the the email right there. Um, let us know that what we can do to to help you. Um, just to better understand and absorb all of this kind of content. We love doing it. Uh, and so we're, we're happy to do this kind of thing again and in other kinds of ways. Thanks everybody for attending. We'll probably do this again. I have a feeling. Happy CLP day. Yes. Take care. Bye.